online for Thursday, March 26th. Um, we've been doing this almost two weeks now uh, and uh, very excited to key off our discussion today about broadband, the coronavirus, and K-12 education. And we've got a, a great panel of, of experts who will be speaking to the key subjects about broadband distance learning uh, and how that's going in K-12 through schools. But just before we do, I wanted to raise a couple points. Um, we're now uh, almost two weeks into, uh, I guess what's been termed a, uh, you know, 15 days to stop the spread by the Trump administration. And, and uh, you know, we're certainly hunkering down here. I'm in my home office. And I think most most of our guests, both on this program and, and other programs we've had are are, are from, from home or, or, or webcast from home. And so, you know, we're certainly trying to do our part in that effort, uh, you know, I and most of our guests are not public health experts by any means, but um, you know it's just it's worth noting the the, it's the scope of what we're dealing with right now. I mean, I just checked the Johns Hopkins web tracker before uh, we started here, and and there are now uh, four hundred ninety two thousand six hundred three cases of the coronavirus globally. That's confirmed COVID-19 cases, right? And so we're, we're almost to half a million. This is this is just truly uh, an extraordinarily um, uh, extensive uh, impact uh, globally. And, and obviously here in the United States, we're now to the point of 69,242 cases in the US and, and globally uh, 20, 22,000 have died in the United States uh, 1,046 as as of just a few moments ago. So so that's just to give us a sense that you know for, if there are any still doubting that this is a significant impact and we need to do a lot and a lot more to make sure we are distancing and uh, staying apart and not you know getting too close together. And so what that means, of course, is that we need to use tools like broadband. We need to use distance learning, as it's often been called. Uh, to, to ensure that we can continue with some semblance of daily life. Uh, you know, the five kids who, who are living with my wife and I, you know, they all have some kind of schooling arrangement and it's all different. Uh, and so, so there's a lot of confusion. And I'm, my hope is that our panel today can help us get at some of the things going on in K through 12 education and how uh, broadband can help with that. So I'm gonna open up to our panel now. Uh, we have Susan M. Clare, who is the uh, Learning Infrastructure Coordinator for the Virginia Department of Education. She will speak first. And then we have Elizabeth Hoover, who is the Chief Technology Officer for the City of Alexandria Public Schools, also in Virginia. And then we have uh, Keith Kruger, who's the uh, CEO of the Consortium of School Networking. And he'll speak about what COSIN is and, and how it supports the educational mission of uh, online education. So with that, let me turn it over to you, Susan. Uh, give us a sense about Virginia, uh, the school system, and what is being done on the state level, as well as perhaps locally. Uh, so thank you, Drew. So uh, in Virginia, we have 132 school divisions and uh, each one of those school divisions is very different in terms of their geography, uh, student population, and uh, their, you know, their staff capacity and resources. And uh, one of my main responsibilities here at DOE is to coordinate and facilitate the K through 12 learning infrastructure program. And one of the priorities of that program has been to um, collaborate with schools and to provide leadership on digital equity issues. And uh, last summer, uh, Virginia was one of the first states to uh, hold a digital equity summit to raise awareness of the um, what Commissioner Rosen Worsell refers to as a homework gap. Uh, we refer to it as a learning at home gap. Here in Virginia, we've kind of coined our own phrase. Uh, and the purpose of the summit was to bring educators and other stakeholders, because as you know, community uh, broadband, it, there's, um, there's a lot more people involved than just education. But specifically, we did invite education leaders to be part of this conversation to raise awareness about digital equity issues uh, in Virginia. And um, 
to raise awareness and also to present potential solutions to digital equity problems. So um, this digital equity issue is a very broad issue once you get in and you start studying it. Um, it has its tentacles in all different facets of, of the community. Uh, but if I really had to boil it down, I would say it's an availability issue and it's an affordability issue. So under each one of those columns, if you were to take a piece of paper and you would draw a column down the middle, put one side and uh, affordability on the other side, then you could start outlining the issues under each one of those. So um, during this coronavirus um, uh, pandemic, I have been in touch with our school division technology leaders. So most of those leaders are uh, technology directors in, in a school division. It could be a large school division. They might be a chief technology officer, an assistant superintendent uh, that is responsible or CTO such as, such as Elizabeth. And um, they're really on the ground dealing with uh, some of the problems of affordability and availability, right? So uh, if we look at the availability side, uh, what I've heard from school division technology directors, and just wanna mention that the department, we've, we have a communication collaboration tool, which I created about a year and a half ago with our CLIP work group which is an MS Teams channel. And that's how I communicate with our uh, school technology leaders. And well, I try to promote communication collaboration among all these technology directors, because I believe that we have a wealth of uh, expertise in Virginia and we need to share that uh, expertise with each other. So what's been coming across the MX, MS Teams channel is uh, our rural schools in Virginia, uh, they, their immediate needs right now are for, they want the uh, mobile wireless carriers to, um, to lift the data caps uh, on student and teacher uh, smartphones. Uh, that, that's one immediate request that I'm starting to hear over and over again. I don't know exactly how the carriers could do that, but that is one of their immediate requests. Uh, because schools are in the process of either planning or have some type of strategic plan around uh, delivering instruction, curriculum and instruction over, over the internet. Um, so that's an immediate request. The other immediate request that I'm seeing from, from school divisions at this time is for wireless carriers to, um, uh, to provide or to activate the hotspot feature on a on a smartphone. So apparently, in, in some cases, the uh, uh, the smartphone uh, may have the hotspot feature turned on. But if not, uh, we're, our immediate ask is to have that turned on. Uh, so those are the two immediate requests. And then the third immediate request is the um, the the unavailability of uh, mobile hotspots. Uh, so, so mobile hotspots right now, as probably most people know, are um, on low inventory or, or on back order. Uh, so I'm getting a lot of questions about mobile hotspot availability at this time. So I'm trying to find as much information as I can. I know Khajiit, you know, they have a really good solution out there, but a lot of their technology right now is on back order. So if I had to summarize what the what the major needs are right now, those are the three the three ones. Um, the other, I guess, you know, so if we look at kind of the availability, that's, you know, the issue there, but the affordability issue, there are some mobile carriers out there, uh, mobile wireless carriers, as well as um, internet service providers that have, uh, that have special offers uh, in place to, to um, you know, to provide support to, to families, to low income families. Now, Drew, the other thing I have heard that's kind of disconcerting is that uh, that mobile carriers, mobile wireless carriers took this uh, Keep America Connected pledge. Uh, they, they actually committed to, um, you know, to, to uh, removing uh, data caps uh, from, from mobile technologies. However, I recently heard that this is not actually occurring, that the mobile wireless carriers have not been following through 
uh, with that particular uh, commitment that they made. <clears throat> so you let, know, me, want- let me jump. Let me jump in on that, Susan, um, because we have talked about this on several of our, our our programs. As I have read the Keep Americans Connected pledge, it, it doesn't. It does not have a provision. Some have criticized it for this for eliminating mobile uh, or other band with caps. It, it has provisions not to uh, cut off people and not to charge people late fees and to, quote, make available Wi-Fi hotspots in more places. But but this has been a criticism that some have made about that, quote, pledge, is that it does not, to my knowledge, have that. Now, some carriers are saying, well, we never had caps, and so we don't have them now. Some have lifted them. But you're, you're raising, these are three excellent points. One, to, for mobile providers to lift data caps. That's your requ- your first request. And the second is to uh, get more of these uh, hotspots uh, or to turn on uh, hotspots. And the third being, um, you know, the lack of availability. And by that, you mean they're just not available for, for sale or rent right now, Susan? Is that what you're saying? Uh, yes, I've heard from T-Mobile um, that they're, they have a very low supply or no supply of uh, mobile hotspots right now. Uh, and also uh, Khajiit uh, is another company that uh, they've got uh, back orders on their, on their mobile uh, hotspots as well. They call them smart spots. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And actually, I, I, I'm going to encourage people to tweet uh, to us. I just there's a tweet here from Benton uh, Institute for Broadband Society uh, asking pointedly this question that the FCC should be talking to carriers and working out what's going on with the networks. What are they doing to increase capacity uh, at, at home and our on our data caps on fixed broadband networks just mm-hmm. anymore they're they're vo- focusing on the fixed one and you've emphasized susan the problem here is mobile because a lot of the, the I, i'm presuming maybe I'm, I'm, I'm inferring that that a lot of the access issues are because some people don't have fixed broadband and they have mobile broadband and they can't really do their tell their their tele education on that when there's data caps is that is that what you're saying susan uh, yes, yes, that is concern. That is the concern from school yeah. divisions. Yes, and of course, you know, there we have uh, rural places in Virginia, just like other states, uh, where you know we we know that people live in a very rural area and they will not even have access to LTE. So uh, there's you know different school divisions are taking initiatives to how do we serve those students. Um, I've heard from um, a couple of school division technology directors that they're they're putting uh, their instructional content on USB drives and they're delivering those to mm. students. Uh, so, you know, so they're coming up with some innovative ways to, uh, you know, to serve those students who, who may not have internet access at home. So one more question, Susan, I just, just as a basic factual matter here, and, uh, you know, I do have one of, one of my children registered in uh, Virginia school district, the Fairfax County school district, not, not Elizabeth's here. And, um, we're still kind of waiting for what is the plan, right? So could you just talk to, I mean, schools have said they're closed, but I'm not getting a clear answer about whether that means they're going to or not do online education. Just give us an answer for Virginia to the extent you know how many counties have said we're going to do some kind of educational uh, in in the interim, while schools are closed till May one, or we're just going to kind of encourage you to do education on your own. What what's what's happening on on the ground level, Susan, across Virginia? Uh, well, Drew, I think there's some variation across our school divisions. Uh, some divisions were very much ready because they had one to one computing device programs, and so since they had the devices in place and the services that that go with that, um, you know the you know the the technology was, you know, was in place to move ahead with uh, an approach to um, instruction at home, Uh, whereas other school divisions, uh, you know, may may not have one-to-one programs, they may not have had any uh, hotspot devices uh, deployed. Uh, You know, we've got some very large school divisions in Virginia that serve, um, you know, high ESL populations. And I know that some of these school divisions are still in the planning stages of how they're going to roll out instruction. So some of them are in different stages of how they're going to deliver instruction. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And if there's if there's ever been a more convincing case for one to 
one, you know, one device for one student, it's this, right? I mean, I've heard from people across the country. Uh, One of my sisters lives in Ohio, and I understand they have in Columbus a one-to-one policy in her school district. So boom, it's kind of like you're ready to go. Whereas in Fairfax County and perhaps other counties, we're kind of still waiting for a plan to be made uh, because that that one-to-one hasn't been in place. So, Susan, anything else you want to say? I'd love to kind of drill into the local level with Elizabeth uh, here, but uh, any quick follow-up, Susan? Yeah, just just one other thing, Drew, that I'm working pretty closely with our uh, governor's chief broadband advisor and his policy uh, specialist. Um, We are, you know, every all the um, information that I get from our schools, uh, I'm sending to our chief broadband advisor, and he is currently in conversations with the mobile wireless carriers and the internet service providers uh, at the state level. So hopefully we'll see some um, more advocacy and uh, also hopeful that the FCC will start making some uh, waivers or rulings uh, in, favors of, in favor of schools and libraries. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. Elizabeth, let's, let's go to you. What's what's your life been like over the last two weeks? Well, I'm very tired. I can tell you that um, we've all been working hard. All our teachers, all of our staff, our families, and we're just so grateful um, for how everybody's pitched in. Um, I will say, you know, we do have the benefit of a one to one. We started our high school one to one 15 years ago. Um, our middle school students have had a one to one for five years, um, and our grades three through five students have been taking home their Chromebooks for two weeks now. So it's it's varied. So we've got the infrastructure, we've got the PD, our teachers are willing and ready, but we we are feeling the pain that Susan talked about. We've got about 15% of our students that don't have internet access. And this has not been the issue in the past because we have a partnership with Kajit. We've been um, uh, providing students without internet access at home uh, with Kajit. We have about 500. Um, but what we found out when we were what, 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 what are, the the uh, the the smart spots that Susan was talking about from the company Kajit. So we Kajit. How do you spell that? K A J E E T. So okay, excellent. Thank you. They they have been a great solution when we're in school and kids are taking their Chromebooks home or after school. What we found out was a lot of our students were actually using their hotspot on their phone instead of taking a Khajiit home. It's very different when you're doing that for homework than if you're doing it all day long. And so now the students that were using um, their hotspots as a solution, it's no longer a solution. Um, And we can't order any more Khajiit, um, as Susan talked about. We've um, also been really pushing internet essentials from Comcast for a lot of our families but um, there's still a lot of barriers. If you haven't paid, uh, if you've got outstanding bills with them, um, that's a challenge. If you live in a household with multiple families and one person hasn't paid a bill, that's a challenge. So we are, um, we're really struggling because we want to start new instruction after spring break on the 13th of April, but we can't really do that. When we can't do it equitably without internet access for all. I'm, I'm feeling very passionate and upset by it because it's really the, the thing that is our biggest challenge right now in ACPS. So l- I have a couple of questions that I want to ask you here. Uh, let's talk about one to one. Again, uh, some some uh, broadband geeks uh, l- like ourselves maybe are familiar with that term, but could you just define it a little bit more for all of our audience? What, what exactly does it mean both from a device perspective and from a learning, how it impacts the learning process? Oh, certainly. So what it means is um, we provide a st- our, each of our students a Chromebook um, to take ho- to use during the school day and to take home grades six through 12. Um, we also have Chromebooks, a one to one environment in the classroom for grades three through five. Did I did I just lose? People? No, no, we're still here. Keep keep talking. Yeah, we're good. Keep going. <laughs> One of the things, oh, go ahead, Elizabeth. Okay, please. I'm sorry. No, uh, no, it, it happens. Uh, we just have to be a little more forgiving. Just let our standards down a little bit here. I've got kids doing their schoolwork probably. Um, so um, our, for our elementary schools, our students have a Chromebook that they use in the during the day, but they have not taken them home. 
So you can have a one-to-one -one program that's a take-home program. The kids take their devices home with them every night or a one-to-one -one program that the, the Chromebooks or the device actually stays in the building. So we were, we were varied. Okay, so so now could you speak about uh, a couple questions for how this works again over the last two weeks as as uh, s schools have been closed in in Virginia during that time? Um, so so what are some issues you're you're encountering on the bandwidth end, right? I, I mean, and and this may lead into some of the things that Keith Kruger will speak to when we get him back, but also from the teacher's perspective. So so what exactly is the way a teacher in the Alexandria public school systems is is working right now? What is their experience in the, the is it is it like a video classroom or is it boards or things like that? And then also finally from the student's perspective, what I mean to the extent you know you have that info of what's the student's experience like? Are they just like opening their one-to-one -one devices at a certain time? Uh, how how is the, the current experience different from the one-to-one -one experience that you had been doing before the coronavirus? Um, so it, it's changing. So right now, um, for until the end of spring break, we are just doing a continuity of learning. Um, teachers are reaching out to students. They're posting on uh, Canvas, which is our learning management system for 6th through 12th, um, 12th grades. They're posting assignments. It's all review and engagement and enrichment right now. Um, and then in the elementary schools, where we use uh, uh, Clever as one of our tools to, to, to um, streamline the resources for our students. And we've been using Zoom with the integration with Clever. So what that means is, and it happened um, yesterday, my daughter's third grade teacher uh, had a morning meeting with, all, with the students in her class. So they spent about an hour online, face-to-face, -face, um, doing a morning meeting. So we're really doing a variety of things. Um, we've got great tools, we've got great partnerships. But the problem is, if you, if you can't get all 25 kids in the in the Zoom class because they don't have internet access, we're, we're really failing our kids. So what, what do you do? What what can you do to kind of accommodate? I mean, even if they can't be in, I mean, you're still having the class, right? So so talk a little bit about that. Well, so right now, um, in this two, this you know, we, we thought we would only be out to the thirteenth. So right now, what our teachers are doing is they're doing trying to provide instruction for a couple hours a day. Um, it's very very it's extremely varied across um, our schools right now, uh, but we're working right now our curriculum instruction and teams of teachers to figure out what is that going to look like as we go into the fourth quarter. How are we going to ensure that? All the students are getting learning and what, what is what is the time how many hours a day does that mean that you're either online or you're working you know offline so this is truly building a plane as we fly it yes i've heard that expression several times let me ask susan a question uh just from a, again i know it's it's great we have both you from the state of virginia or commonwealth of virginia susan and and elizabeth from a from a school district but what what is happening from the perspective of closures right i mean there there is a, a governor ordered closure till may one is is that the sense that that's going to be extended or is no one just willing to talk about that yet but uh we'll, we'll see i mean what, what's the kind of sense for the rest of the school year throughout virginia and then how does that translate to you in alexandria elizabeth susan uh well schools in virginia have been closed for the rest of the year, Drew. Uh, you know, the uh, Governor Northam just uh, just just made that decision. So, and I think one of the major decisions that we've made here in Virginia, I know our superintendent of public instruction, Dr. James Lane, uh, has been working with the USDOE and uh, is has canceled at, uh, SOL testing. Uh, because we just simply can't prepare students for, you know, that's a major event in, in schools and it's tied to accreditation. So, uh, you know, that's, that's kind of where Virginia is okay. headed now. Well, my, my apologies. I got, I got different states confused because some states have said till May 1 and some states have said for the end yeah. of the year. So, but, but there is learning, right? I mean, is that not the, I mean, it, it you're, you're not encouraging school districts to not do it, are, are you? I mean, no, no. I mean, in, in the Virginia Department of Education, I know that our entire staff is uh, is gearing up to, uh, to deliver a series of webinars to all of our school divisions. I know I'm working with our Office of STEM uh, on, you know, virtual Virginia initiatives. Um, we have open education resources here in Virginia 
Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with those, but those are digital resources. Uh, we, it's a collection of digital resources that can be delivered um, over the internet, uh, digital textbooks and things like that. I know our Department of Instruction is, is working furiously to, you know, to gear up some initiatives to, to get this information down to uh, the school divisions. We also have a frequently asked questions uh, which is pretty comprehensive on the on the Department of Ed Virginia Department of Education website for school divisions, some guidance and uh, you know information there about um, how to handle the situation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So Elizabeth, could you speak to how you're adapting? I mean, again, I, I know it's been an evolving situation, right? So when you were saying earlier in your comments, you thought you were just close to the 13th, and obviously you're now close for the rest of the year, but what? How does that impact the way you're doing your your learning, even if you aren't going to do the standards of learning test, et cetera, that that, that Susan has just referred to? Um, well, we're we are uh, moving forward with trying to do our distance learning plan. Um, we don't know that that may even continue into the summer. So we're building out those resources. I feel like I've got two weeks to figure out some solutions for our ten percent of kids that do not have internet access at home. Um, We've got all these things in place and we've been working for years to get to be able to do some of these things. So it's a real opportunity for us. Um, and not that we want to be in this situation, but I think um, I think when we open school back up next fall, we're going to be teaching differently than we were on March. Oh, so, so how how will this impact things going forward in your view? Well, I, I think this has really forced um, some teachers to uh, uh, and administrators, because I've got to talk about our administrators are doing a great job with it too, but force them to really dig into some of our tools and use them creatively and innovatively. I mean, this is a time of great innovation. I mean, if we can yeah. look at it that way. Um, so if you've got to look at for opportunities, I would say this innovation um, may be coming from, from this situation we're in. Great, great. Well, let's let's go ahead and turn to um, to Keith. I know you've had a couple issues with your um, with your video stream, but let's hold our fingers crossed and give this a try because uh, uh, you just you seem absent when you're not there. So so sure. so Keith, tell us a little about about the Consortium of School Networking and how you relate and work with people like Susan and Elizabeth. Absolutely. Thanks, Drew. And I think you're going to have to rebrand this as the broadband brunch. This is not breakfast anymore. But uh, uh, Some parts of the country, we're still at breakfast hour. <laughs> well, that's true. But I think brunch covers lunchtime. And, and uh, so anyway, just a suggestion. Anyway, uh, we are the professional association for people like Elizabeth. Uh, we've been around for nearly 30 years, and I've been working with COSIN as their uh, CEO for almost all of those years, not the first few years. And we work closely with state departments of education uh, like Susan and her association, CETA. So, um, you know, we really see this as a defining moment for those of us that have been advocating for the use of technology in schools. Uh, it's an inflection moment. Uh, typically, uh, technology by many educators has been thought of as an option for supplemental classroom instruction. And I think what we're seeing in this COVID-19 moment is that ed tech is now a requirement, not a choice. Um, you know, I, I think we've already kind of highlighted how at school we've made significant progress in preparation for the moment. Uh, in fact, our uh, survey, we do a, a national survey of uh, chief technology officers and nearly half of all schools have a one-to-one -one device per student environment uh, as Elizabeth has uh, in, in uh, Alexandria City. But what this moment is calling for is home access. And uh, we've already heard the talk about the homework gap. You know, when, when school-age students lack that uh, connectivity to do schoolwork at home or, or at least outside of the school. And, and that gap is vast. Uh, there are about 12 million children, according to the Pew Internet and American Life uh, series, that don't have broadband at home. So fundamentally, this is an equity issue. Um, typically, those students that are unconnected uh, are, come from low income, mostly minority families. Now, I think we have to be very clear, many of those students do have a device and have some sort of internet access, 
but that's typically in low income families, a mobile phone on a data capped internet plan. So the thing Susan was just talking about with data caps is critical. Can you imagine doing your school assignments on your cell phone? It doesn't work for virtual learning, even in the wake of a pandemic. And, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of things that uh, you, Drew, have brought up over the years about what policymakers should be doing. And now is the moment uh, for that. Uh, we've just seen the new, uh, uh, the Senate has passed last night, uh, you know, the stimulus bill, which has pieces in it. Unfortunately, they did not include the, the provision that the House had been considering for $2 billion to supplemental to go through the E-rate program that would have funded some of these things that are needed. Now, there are funds through the US Department of Ed that are flexible and can be used for technology, but they didn't, they, they missed the mark in, in providing uh, that. And I think, you know, the, the, the specific issue of the, the what industry can do, the FCC, um, you know, had a pledge that many providers have, have signed on to. Sadly, it didn't address this particular uh, home issue. And we're seeing some solutions that some providers are providing, but often they don't address teacher access. So that's a huge problem. Uh, the FCC has done th some things like they've waived the gift ban, but really they have not uh, use their emergency powers to, to solve some of these issues. And so the ball is in their court. And, you know, I just maybe, I know you want this to be interactive, but, you know, the reality is that you can't snap your fingers and be ready to do online learning overnight. And I think even those districts like Alexandria City, which have been leaders in use of technology, uh, have big challenges to do this for all students, all grades, all at once. There's cybersecurity challenges, there's privacy, there's the biggest one is teacher training. While the what I'm hearing from CTOs around the country is that even when we can we can fix the infrastructure and device problems, but even then our the teacher training uh, is is a huge gap. And uh, even though many school districts have been doing great jobs around online learning for years and, and they have what I used to call snow days, what are sometimes called now e-learning days. No one has really tried to do online learning for all grades, for all students for two, three weeks, even month. And now in certain states, they're saying through the end of the year, like in Virginia, um, the reality, you know, is that not everything is going to go perfect. Um, this is a huge mountain to climb. I think it's a wake-up call. But, you know, as Winston Churchill said, never let a good crisis go to waste. So this is a learning moment for all, of, not only for students, but I think for teachers and parents and administrators. And, um, you know, we have to lean into that. We have to realize that uh, we're, we're not really ready as a country and we need to ensure broadband to the home uh, to make learning con continuity. No, excellent. And you've, you've teed up several great issues that I'd love us to, to, to focus on a little bit more. I mean, one of them is, is the, the, um, the homework gap, which is a real issue that now is acutely recognized. And, and thank you for mentioning the, 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 the discussion that, that did not get into the um, Coronavirus uh, Cares Act, the stimulus bill that the Senate has passed and now goes to the House. Um, there was a, a small amount by the standards, 200 million, uh, to go to the FCC for telehealth initiatives. But you're correct, Keith, in that the the big discussion people have been talking about is uh, making uh, a greater bandwidth available or free internet access available or a proposal that Harold Feld of Public Knowledge discussed on our Broadband Breakfast Live online on Monday, uh, basically paying, having this package pay for broadband for 
for uh, every American for, for two months as a double stimulus, keeping people connected and providing uh, resources to telecommunications companies. That, that's one set of issues, sort of the, the policy issues and the access issues, and, and also just the, the logistics of how this works, right? How education happens. And I'd love to talk a little bit more about that um, uh, in terms of the, the what what the experience is like again i recognize this is a less than ideal situation for for testing it but but elizabeth are there are there some good examples that you can point to about um what ways teachers have adapted to the the circumstances and um are, are there are there any any things you're hearing about um well, at least this is coming out of this. I mean, any silver linings, if you will, for the the fact that that um, a quarter or more of a school year is is wiped out. A any thoughts on that, Elizabeth? Um, yes, I, I think we're just we're starting to see some good things happen. And you know, one thing I I kind of chuckle at is we've talked about technology and education for instruction, but what I'm seeing is technology used from teachers to students to support their sub uh, their emotional um, well being their mental health right now, because this is a yeah. really tough time. And for students to be able to connect to their teacher, I mean, it's it's just a phenomenal experience. And, you know, you you can't be ready to learn unless you are ready to learn. And you've got your, you're not hungry, you're not worried, you, you know, you're not scared. And these are times that a lot of our students are feeling all of this. So, so I'm seeing a great deal of technology being used to support our students um, emotionally um, and mentally. So I think that is great. Um, I'm seeing teachers really push out like their their presentations um, have, being available for office hours. We don't have office hours in K-12. Um, I've seen it again, like face to face through um, and we're using Zoom, but you could do other things um, and or it could be having email. And I, I also think um, we've been talking about staff, students and, and administrators, but this is a huge impact on families right now. I mean, this is a whole new world children upstairs, children in your house while you're working and um, and you're looking at different grade levels. It's one thing to have teenagers doing online courses. It's another to have elementary students, you know, working through some problems. Yeah. Yeah. That takes a whole different type of engagement that we don't usually put in our families. Yes. Susan, do you have any thoughts on that and, and particularly how teachers have been able to adapt to these tools? I, I, I can't recall whether um, you or Elizabeth spoke about the different tools being used, Canvas and and um, uh, 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 Zoom and, and 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 another another tool. But but what what are the are 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 teachers able to handle and um, I mean, what's the, what's the experience they're having as they're working through uh, these online learning experiences? Uh, well, I've heard uh, the same things that Elizabeth is saying from uh, educators that uh, even if we could wave a magic wand and have the affordability and availability issues resolved mm -hmm. tomorrow, for instance, uh, we still have the issue of uh, professional teacher readiness uh, right. that is just not there yet. So um, I know that some of our technology directors are uh, they're they're using or their teachers are very uh, savvy with their LMS system and um, can push out instruction. Uh, some of them are using Zoom meeting, uh, but there are technical difficulties with uh, excuse me with Google Hangout or Google Meets. I'm hearing some uh, you know some technical issues around using that particular technology. Um, a lot of uh, divisions are using Zoom technology, but particularly for administrative uh, and faculty meetings. Uh, but yeah, it's it's going to come back to the professional development. You know, a lot of teachers simply aren't prepared to teach from home. And the other problem is some of our teachers don't have Internet access at home. Yeah. Yeah, well, bandwidth is definitely a challenge. And I'll pull up this this uh, comment we got from Bert Thomas, uh, which references a blog post, and you can you can see these on on our streams uh, or on our Twitter feed. Um, but uh, it just discusses the issue of low bandwidth alternatives. So again, I'm not one to want to encourage low bandwidth, but but I think that sometimes you want solutions that work no matter what. And and yeah. again, you know, Keith, we certainly didn't want you to be you know knocked off, but but I, I think it's it's 
it's great to have everyone and to be able to see everyone and for our audience to see us too. Uh, and, and so I just I just wonder if if you have maybe let's start with on this one with Keith about the bandwidth question and what kind of bandwidths are needed and and also about I mean you of course deal with a lot of bandwidth issues within schools and and e rate issues. I wonder if you could talk about those too, kind of two aspects of bandwidth there. Keith. Well, in, in la uh, our annual conference of chief technology officers was supposed to happen last week face to face. We were now going virtual, but we did the first keynote and it was last week with Amber uh, Case, who is a, a anthropologist on technology. Her big thing is uh, calm technology. She worked with John Seeley Brown uh, and kind of continuing his work that technology shouldn't be a distraction. And I thought one of her fascinating, she had a lot of uh, interesting comments you can watch it on archive, uh, but uh, she was talking about how she was at the consumer technology uh, uh, conference at the beginning of January, and all the buzz was about, uh, you know, 5G, 6G, all the, the, and what she said, you know, we really have to rethink low bandwidth uh, kind of solutions and, and not have this disposable, uh, you know, we have to design so that all these solutions we have don't become irrelevant the next time you get a new technical standard. We have to make sure that it's not a distraction. And fun, fundamentally, the greatest scarcity we have is our humanity. It isn't technology. And so this is about people. And um, I think the leaders like Susan and Elizabeth, you know, what we have to remind people is, um, you know, we can't, we, we have to fundamentally uh, be, uh, be good people and we have to find ways to keep people connected and in this time of crisis nothing is more important and I like that a, a Susan, that Su uh, Elizabeth came back to you know social emotional learning and how do we use technology to solve that um, technology is not a, an end in itself it's a means in which to solve whatever the problems we are or, or be a distraction to the problems we are facing so um, th that's kind of a high level what I've been thinking about. Yeah, I, I wanna raise another issue for all of our panelists. I'm gonna kind of maybe express a point of view here. I feel two things very strongly. One is that we do need universal broadband. We need very high quality universal broadband. And, and as broadband is seen appropriately so as more of a utility and there's, there's a, a linkage into a basic need, um, you know, we, we really need to make sure that, that there's that universality to it. At the same time, I, I, I don't think that we should be stopped from doing positive things because maybe everyone doesn't have broadband. And so I, I'm sometimes feeling like are schools taking the approach that they can't do learning yeah. because not everyone has. And I'd love your reactions, okay? Because because I I just I I, I mean I I don't want things to stop. Obviously, we're not in the perfect situation, but but um, can can it, what can a school do if not everyone has broadband right now and they still want to continue learning? Keith. I'll take, I'll, I'll lead off with that. And we, you know, North Shores, right outside of Seattle, school district, one-to-one uh, -one district. They uh, were one of the, two weeks ago, they were one of the first districts that shut down and sent all their kids home. They intended to go online. They, they felt though that they couldn't assure it for every kid with special needs, so they stopped. Uh, and I think that was a, a, a clear warning sign. And the U.S. Department of Ed over the weekend did put out new guidance that uh, complying with the Americans with Disabilities and IDEA and other special needs should not be an excuse for not providing any online learning. And I think that's an important message to educators. Um, obviously, we want to get to where there is good practice around uh, kids with special needs, but we we have we can't just stop everything because we can't do it for everyone and there has to be accommodation you know and, and some of the online learning isn't going to be appropriate for the youngest children it isn't going to you know we can't have a one size fits all but we can't stop everything because we can't do it for everyone Elizabeth and then Susan, what are your reactions? I, you know, I've I've actually thought a lot about that too. I mean, we are so close. I feel like we we're, you know we're, we have the advantage of being a smaller school system. So I, I fully recognize that we can, we can be more nimble and flexible than larger school systems. Um, 
So we're, we are going to move forward. And um, I think we can find solutions for our about 2000 students um, that can't access it right now. Um, I don't know if I'm, I am just forever hopeful, but I just think solutions are out there and we will continue to work with our partners to fig figure that out. Um, like yeah. Keith said though, I mean, it's, it, we, we're always about a balance. I'm always about a balance in using technology. And so um, there are some things that are going to be better done off technology. We need to know, need to support those things as well. I and mean, especially our younger, our younger learners. Just to get perspective, Elizabeth, is that 2,000 students with without access? And how many students overall? We have about 16,000 students. And I'll tell you, we're, we're digging deep now. We're connecting with families over the phone, trying to figure out the exact numbers. But that's my best estimate based on um, our experience wow. and our surveys. So you're saying about 12% or so yeah. of your students don't have the access they need to be able to do the work. Susan, your thoughts on this question? Uh, yeah, well, th that's another issue is that some of our school divisions collect this data. Um, so I've, I've been collecting it at the state level. I've been not that specifically, but I've been asking schools to estimate the uh, number of students that do not have internet access at home. And so some of them have those sur that survey data, but some do not. So they simply they simply don't know or they're just, you know, estimating based on, uh, you know, the information that they have. But, um, yeah, I think the one of the reasons why there's in Virginia, there's an urgent need for those two items that I mentioned, Drew, the um, unlimited data caps and then uh, turning on the hotspot features is because schools want to use smartphones because they're the least common denominator. And by that, I mean that most students, and Elizabeth can probably confirm this, most students have a smartphone with a, you know, with a data cap. Mm -hmm. uh, and so if they can push some type of instruction out through a smartphone, like videos or email or Facebook, whatever it is, um, that will um, it, it at least be one option until they can think of, um, you know, pushing out other technologies and other methods to deliver instruction. Well, Susan, I really appreciate your coming back to these two action items, mobile uh, access, uh, uh, lifting data caps and turning on the feature that allows hotspots. And let's take a few minutes here. We, we've got an, another 10 minutes or so to strategize a little bit about this because these are action items that that I assume are doable, right? I, I believe they're doable. And and we, we've actually had discussions on, on this show on Broadband Breakfast Live Online that, that led to some FCC policy changes. So Susan, let's just start off. Who have you called? Who have you talked to? And who is, uh, who is cooperating and who is not cooperating? I mean, maybe we can certainly take this up with the individuals and entities on a temporary basis to uh, get rid of bandwidth caps on mobile devices? Uh, well, I have been communicating to our chief broadband advisor. And so since he's the chief broadband advisor to the governor, uh, I've been communicating with him almost every day about what the um, immediate needs are in Virginia. So he's the one that's actually making the phone calls to the mobile wireless carriers uh, with this request. And um, I'm just, you know, acting as the conduit uh, right. because at, at his level, I think he's able to probably get more things uh, accomplished. What 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 have, what kind of feedback have you gotten? Has have any of those uh, carriers said yes? Have any said uh, no? Are yeah, they saying they all told him that, yes, they would um, they would provide unlimited data caps. And, you know, those were the major wireless uh, mobile care carriers that told him that they would provide unlimited data. However, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, it seems that there are some cases where uh, the mobile wireless carriers are simply not, um, uh, you know, they're not carrying uh, or they're not committed to, to that particular commitment right now. Uh, so Did your broad... Did your broadband advisor ask on behalf of just Virginia consumers or or nationwide? Uh, I think he's I think he's really focused on the needs of Virginia right now. Mm -hmm. So Drew, um, Coastin yeah. has been uh, we've joined with over twenty other national education associations, including superintendents, the teachers unions, the library association, 
uh, the business officials, the elementary and secondary school principals, the PTA. We've written to the FCC um, asking that they take these sort of emergency actions to provide home internet uh, equity. And um, we also were part with the Future Ready uh, initiative. Uh, within 48 hours, over 8,000 educators uh, signed a petition that we have, um, uh, you know, I'd encourage you to look at that. I think they've closed the petition and sent the finding, the, the re recommendation on to Chairman Pai. Um, obviously, uh, Commissioner Rosenwurzel uh, and uh, Commissioner Starks have been uh, meeting. We, we had a, our advocacy day, which was supposed to be face-to-face -face last week. We did it virtually. So about 50 advocates met with uh, the two commissioners, uh, and I think both of them have stated their strong support uh, for using uh, the E-rate in new flexible ways. There is a uh, concern, by, I think, by the majority around uh, impact on, even though there is funding in the E-rate program under the data, under the caps, the financial caps, there's concern by the majority uh, and, and industry that that could cause a rise in contribution factor, which is why we want Congress to provide supplemental information uh, funding, the $2 billion that Senator Cantwell has, yeah. has uh, proposed. So, so you know, this is great. Just to be clear, Keith, the, the, the issue of the bandwidth caps, the, the proposal that, that the, two, the 20 uh, school groups, uh, school, school boards and others and these many others signed on to was basically asking the FCC to to do to do what specifically uh, with regard to bandwidth caps? Not 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 talking now about E-rate. I'm not talking right? about bandwidth. I was just talking about generally. They have a okay. lot of different emergency discretionary authority that they could take in order to uh, allow E-rate funds to be used for this home access. Right. Uh, right. And but it's separate from the issue of data caps and what the right. what influence the FCC could put on industry. Uh, they got the, the industry to largely sign a pledge, but the pledge didn't mention this particular issue. They have uh, waived the gift ban, so companies yeah. can do that, go, do some things there that they, which we think is good. But charity it only will get you so far. We have to actually fix this problem. Right. Right. Um, no, and, and, and this is quite positive. I mean, th there's certainly been discussions about E-rate changes. You've mentioned the gift ban that was actually discussed last week on our program by John Windhausen and, and uh, Blair Levin and, and, and uh, uh, others. But, but I'm, I'm just wondering to focus in on this bandwidth issue and, and is there a way, as it is such an immediate need, identified by, by Susan. Elizabeth, what, what are your thoughts? How would, how would a, a lifting bandwidth caps uh, affect um, your students and teachers in uh, Alexandria? I, I certainly think it would be helpful. I think we're going to have to have a, a multi-approach to this right now to, you know, get us through. I mean, we, again, I, we've been working with Comcast, but their internet essentials program has been so popular that they are running out of their own inventory as well. Um, and their 60 day free access doesn't cover our three months um, anymore. So originally it worked out for us. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I think that, um, I think that, yeah, I think, I think the mobile caps would certainly be helpful. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, 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 wonderful. Are there other specifics that you think, uh, Keith or, or Susan or Elizabeth, that, that the FCC well, should I think be doing? Need to, you know, if, if learning is happening from home, they need to consider, uh, you know, the, the FCC under E-rate has not allowed school districts to, to um, consider the, that. So, you know, so they need to waive those, those rules. On an emergency basis, they need to provide funding. There's money that they're not, they haven't yet reached, and either the FCC needs to allow us to to use that unreached cap, or Congress um, needs, in the next stimulus package, needs to actually provide the two billion dollars that Senator Cantwell has proposed. And Drew, I'll just add to um, what Keith was saying with E-rate. Um, what what some stakeholders have proposed, such as uh, Shelby, um, 
is uh, that let's you know have the FCC uh, use the Universal Service Fund, not necessarily E rate, okay? Right. But use the USF funds because there's a lot of money in there right now that's not being used, and use that money for um, letting schools and libraries uh, purchase Wi-Fi hotspots. So something like a lending uh, request. Yeah, yeah. Good, good. Uh, more specifics, Elizabeth, that you can think of that the FCC or others should be doing to address this urgent need. Um, yeah, I, I think it needs to be a utility in everyone's home. I mean, this is, um, it's not just a school problem. It's its a local, local government problem. You know, when I look at our city, we offer so many of our services that you have to get online. And um, this is, this is much larger than just schools, as you know, but um, it's, it's, it's extremely frustrating that we've done all this work for so many years and we're still at this point and we can't offer the one thing that everyone, the majority of us rely on. Yeah, uh, let, let, I wanna ask about that, about those other services and how those go forward, right? And and how that kind of changes maybe our, our thinking about um, uh, what the role of schools is, uh, j just briefly, but, but also, could you also comment, all, all of you, and maybe this can be our last topic, is how should uh, parents who are at home with their kids who are now learning, how, do you have any thoughts for those of us who are in this situation right now, right? How, how to kind of manage that? Because again, it's new, we're dealing with this, this is less than two weeks old, this, this challenge, but um, uh, people need, need to uh, you know, have some, some thoughts on that. And you, you three are better equipped than, than most to, to do so. So sure. let me start with you on, on this one. Uh, go ahead, Keith. Well, I was just going to say I'll, I'll, they can answer more from a, a, the educator perspective, but we've taken delegations, you know, even 10 years ago to Uruguay. Uruguay, at the presidential level, they said digital equity is essential and it has to get to the home and we're going to do it through schools. We're going to provide a device and connectivity to every home in Uruguay. It's very poor country. But the interesting thing is that device at night is used by mothers to learn nutrition programs. It, you know, right. there's healthcare, telehealth opportunities. It's the device can be used, you know, for so I, I think we've siloed things and, and haven't gotten it done. And we need to think creatively that similarly in Portugal, you know, there's a an initiative, the federal, the national government there went to an e-government. So the way they were the slowest in creating new business, they're now the fastest in Europe in starting new businesses because it's all done online. The way you file your taxes has to be done online. So the way they did it is they provided it to schools. They provided a fixed amount of bandwidth, but it's a it, uh, that's about a third paid by the government, about a third paid by industry and about a third paid by consumers, which is a sliding fee based on poverty. Now, of course, if you want to see your Netflix, you have to pay more. Right. Oh. Uh, so Thank you for that. Thank you for that great example. Let's get some final thoughts from Elizabeth, and then we'll give the last word to Susan yeah. on this question here. Um, I, I think families and educators are working hard to figure out what schedule works for everybody. And again, having two children in school right now, trying to work my meetings around when they need me is a challenge. We've heard from parents that they want to schedule, um, but they also they don't want everything live because they need to they need to reserve their Wi-Fi for themselves sometimes. They're streaming. And so we're looking for flexibility and balance. I think we are going to all be able to write some great books after this is all over. <laughs> uh, yeah, good point, Elizabeth. So I guess, Drew, my concern would be for your low income families, uh, uh, you know, those parents, uh, you know, what, you know, what do they do to help their child? And I think, you know, Virginia, I've spent a lot of um, time, um, per, you know, helping school divisions become broadband leaders in, you know, in their division, in their community, and to help these low income families uh, understand what, you know, what they need to do to get the access, whether, you know, it's affordability, some of these programs like Comcast, Cox, uh, and then not only just saying, okay, well, here's a low cost program, but actually helping them um, apply for these programs uh, so, so that they can get them in their home. So, you know, there needs to be some facilitation 
on school divisions part to help your low income families, your title one schools. Do, do you advise school districts to have someone who can kind of help navigate almost kind of like an E-rate coordinator, but help navigate uh, getting yeah. access for people? Ab yes, absolutely. Yeah. And That's some good. have done that. Yes. Uh -huh. Elizabeth, just any, any quick reactions to that point that uh, Susan just made? Um, no, I, I think she's absolutely right. I think they're, um, you know, we use our E-rate coordinator. We can always use some additional help um, in our advocacy. You know, I said there are lots of benefits to being small school division, but there's a lot of uh, more obstacles too, because they're not going to listen to us like they might, right. you know, right. Broward County or Fairfax County or some other things. Very good. Very good. Well, uh, we're going to thank our panel of, of Susan, uh, Elizabeth and Keith. Uh, we've, we've come up on the hour of one o'clock uh, Eastern time. Uh, my name is Drew Clark with Broadband Breakfast, and you've been watching live online. Uh, tomorrow, we'll be talking about universal access and the importance of universal access in, in this era of the coronavirus. And as, as we've said before, we've committed to doing this till the end of March, a Monday through Friday. Uh, we, we hope that it's useful for you, and we hope that you'll uh, join us again and see our, our material and for those who are particularly interested in this topic, we'll have links about uh, from the, the panelists on this webpage. Thank you again. Take care and see you later. Bye.